so, so the interesting thing I think that's going to be raised from the stampede trial and how we may change how we approach our patients is let's take a case of a 55 year old male who has a radical prostatectomy has a PSA initially of four and um, he has very high risk pathology Gleason 9 uh, extra capsular extension and never normalizes his PSA after surgery my, my experience those patients are are the poorest group and we've seen that from from Parton's data so are you now going to con have the discussion with the patient that this data is out there that you may delay progression and potentially improve survival I, even though it's not going to be a standard I think we still owe our patients the discussion of that particularly if they're young because that may there, there may be the possibility they can they, they can improve survival later I think that you should write a trial for that I don't disagree you know, Earl, the, uh, the thinking, too, as Joe was alluding to, we, we don't like to ob uh, operate on grossly positive nodal disease, N2, N3 disease. But clearly, as Dan said, the subset analysis in the tax trial showed that uh, perhaps patient local control at prostatectomy was a lead time bias or a true benefit. But other trials are also now suggesting, although not in a prospective randomized way, that local control may improve survival in the face of metastatic disease. And so... Uh, I, I think that the operation now, the incontinence rates in good hands are quite low. I think erectile dysfunction is going to suffer either way because they're going to see engine deprivation. And I will, I had a case just uh, last week, node positive. Uh, I knew it was into the seminal vesicles and I removed it. And then it got a margin negative, although it was an N1. And I think that patient for local control to close them back up like we did 15 right. years ago and send them to radiation. I don't think that's necessary anymore if you can do a good operation, and I think they do benefit from avoiding the complications of obstruction and bleeding in the prostate, et cetera. So it's not evidence-based, but I think there's some rationale to uh, take care of the N1 positive patient. Oh, I, th I would absolutely agree. I think the, the, the concept of, I, th I think we've all t have taken care of enough patients where we didn't take out their prostates. They developed s significant local disease with all the obstructive issues, bleeding, et cetera, and we, we regret the day that we didn't take out their prostate. No, so it's I think, that medical oncologist that right, regrets the day. Right, <laughs> because right, because not only do they have disseminated disease, they have horrible local so disease. So you're, you're in support of the Absol control. Yeah. Listen, I've been in support of that for years. Right. Just there, ask Paul Lang. There, but I just wanted to get it on TV that you're... <laughs> oh, okay. okay. So, there's, so there's nothing worse than having to send somebody for colostomy because they've right. got such bad local obstructive symptoms or invasion into the rectum. And I think that, that surgery potentially can avoid those complications later. So let's play this a little bit forward, just to sort of be thought-provoking a little bit. So now if, if the urology world, and we're all in agreement, based upon the evidence-based data that, that clearly in these patients who are hormone-naive, who present with meta metastatic disease, the treatment should be androgen deprivation therapy plus six cycles of docetaxel chemotherapy. We know it also delays progression in the metastatic CRPC. So play this forward in a, in a few years. So before the arbitrary designation was pre-chemotherapy, post-chemotherapy. So now the patient has MCRPC, yep. has received docetaxel yep. chemotherapy. This gets back to your thinking of, okay, what about the chemotherapy? How, how does the medical oncology world look at it? Because the urology world would look at it and say, oh, well, he's already had chemotherapy. Right. But it's well, a different subset, obviously. It is, but, you know, uh, you're asking me to kind of look into a crystal mm -hmm. ball in a way because we have absolutely no significant experience with patients who are treated with docetaxel, with hormone-sensitive disease, and then progress to you know metastatic CRPC, um, and then you know what do we what do we do? How, no, how is docetaxel going to work? How is enzalutamide going to work? How is abiraterone going to work? And all the other you know radium, any of the drugs that we now have available to us, all were conducted in trials before Correct. any of this took place. So we're going to have a lot of learning to do. But as a medical oncologist, I think we frequently will just as a general rule come back to docetaxel if a patient was responsive to it, um, you know, at some later point, because these patients are living for a long time now, and sometimes you look back and say, oh, yeah, like four years ago they had docetaxel, and now they've had these 20 other things. 
time to try docetaxel again. See, I think you're treating a different disease four years later. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think up front yeah. the synergy of, of, uh, of uh, angin deprivation and docetaxel is going to be different than in the castrate-resistant tumor with with uh, you know castrate levels of testosterone, mm -hmm. the mechanism, I think, and I bet the response rate when that comes out will be quite high. Don't you think, Dan? I think it's going to be so. up there. I, would, I, would, I think, would think that it would be, of course, higher than what you would see later on in, in later stage disease. But you know, I, I think that the real issue is going to be is, is when we start running our clinical scenarios with patients who are castrate resistant, are we going to use the same pattern that we've used before uh, docetaxel was moved into the hormone sensitive state? And, and you know, Tia sort of alluded to that. We, you know, we cycled some of our patients with docetaxel because of toxicity issues. Uh, you know, you get around to six, seven, eight cycles and patients get pretty worn out at that particular point uh, when they're castrate resistant. And, and the real question is, you know, can you reinduce these patients later on? And for the most part, if they're responding the first time, they'll respond again. So I, I'm not so sure it's gonna make that much of, an, uh, that much of a difference on subsequent docetaxel treatment. They probably will remain just as sensitive. Remember, there's going to be a gap between the time that they've received it, uh, and, and that may actually allow the resistance mechanisms to subside. Uh, but we need, it, we need some good biological studies to tell us what's going on. We don't have that. Right. So if, a pa if one of these patients that you're treating goes through his six cycles, has no pain now, and PSA is remarkably uh, lower, are you going to revisit immunotherapy in that patient? So, so you're, you're saying from the hormone sensitive state, Right. Because, yeah, it's important to when they to when, well, when he so, so he's, initially, he's, he's initially been treated with docetaxel and hormones. Correct. And now you want to know when he progresses later on right. whether you should use cipulosal tea. I, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't. Before re-challenging him with right. I, oh, I, yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah, I would run the playbook the exact same right. way. Right. Yep. Now, what I think would be interesting is if we came up with some sort of registry study to look and see if there actually are differences in how uh, these patients respond or of course, uh, some sort of biological correlate study. But no, I, I'm not going to change how I approach the patient in that situation. Uh, I think what I would, would s I still look at is the issue as to how long they're responding. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the other interesting things about charted, uh, going back to Maha Hussein's data, looking at those patients who achieve a PSA of less than four, seven months out after they are under angin blockade, you see that that number is higher in charted than it would be for, for just simply antigen blockade, which is, is showing you that the docetaxel is clearly adding something to the hormone therapy. Uh, th the question is, what do you do with those patients? You know, uh, when they, when, if they don't normalize, you, you still know that they're not gonna do well. And, and uh, the question is, how many of those patients who would not have received chemotherapy, you know, what's the difference in the normalization and how is that affecting it biologically? Could I ask you uh, something outside the urology playbook, which you would know, would be in patients who've had some neuropathy from docetaxel, but had a good response, and later on you re-challenge them, are they more prone to worse neuropathy, or uh, on the second uh, time they're seeing docetaxel, are you expect it to be worse, similar, stable, not maybe get worse? What's your experience? I think it's going to get worse. Worse. It's cumulative. It's, the a neuropathy lot of, is cumulative. Yeah, I yeah. mean, a lot of times it will get better, but it may not completely resolve. But once we go back to docetaxel, it's usually going to be, you know, a problem for the patient. My, my, my general sense is that the neuropathy with cabazitaxel is not yep. as bad as it is with I doci. Agree. And this may be a reason to give cabazi over doci in that particular right. situation. Well, and there's a trial looking at right. that, right? So right, because there are trials that are looking know. at that particular issue. So that was a really great case discussion. Again, I, again, I think this data really needs to circulate amongst the urologist, urology world because oftentimes we're the ones that obviously diagnose these patients with newly metastatic disease. So let's go to case.